we're going to take back up in our study in Titus this morning. So if you would turn to Titus chapter 2. What a blessed celebration we had last week. 18 years of sweet fellowship together. I really enjoyed that time. I wouldn't mind doing that every week. That was nice. We're in a really rich passage of Scripture right now. We are in Titus chapter 2. I just want to review quickly what we've seen in chapter 1. Uh, Paul is writing to Titus, and he said to put in order the things necessary for the church of God to be the bright light in our communities that we have been called to be. We're to be a city set on a hill for all to see. And in this society that is disintegrating so quickly before us, what a beautiful thing the church of God will be in the midst of such devastation and hurt and unraveling. What a beacon of light we will be. What a rescue center for the lost. And so how do you get a church like this? I want that badly, don't you? I, I, playing church is nauseating to me. I desire more than anything that we would be a church like this. And so Paul starts with the leaders. He begins with their character. And then he says they're teaching. They're to be those who teach sound doctrine. They're able to handle accurately the Word of God. They're to preach in season and out of season. They're to teach this Word. Also, they're to silence false teachers, to keep the church a pure place of truth where we can grow in respects to our salvation. And now we can have relationships then that will build up one another in our most precious faith. We now have something to give away as we grow in the Word of God. Now community works. Now we can pour into each other's lives and help each other be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. There is no Lone Ranger kind of thing in the church. We're a team, a church that God by His Spirit has given all gifts necessary to grow us up into our head. No one has all of the gifts in himself, and so this happens by one anothering in relationships and community and sharing. This is how it will take place. And so you have got to throw out this American model that taught us that church is a building that we go sing and hear a sermon and smile and shake hands and go home and say, I did church. You didn't. I, I, you need to understand this. This is church. It's a, a living, vital organism growing each other up into the head of the Lord Jesus Christ with lives being spent, intertwined, and together stirring each other up unto love and good deeds. Now, we're going to look at the discipleship relationships that we must have in the church. And so we saw last time the essential and important role of the older saints in the church. So you do not retire in the church of God. When the world is telling you that you have nothing more to offer it, the church is saying, you're in your glory years. These are your glory years. Pass down what God has taught you in this amazing journey of grace. This is your glory years right now, older saints. Teach us. Don't you want to learn? I'm tired of learning from my own mistakes. I want to learn from yours for a while. <laughs> and so we looked then at what God calls the older saints to be. If you look in Titus 2, verse 2, older men are to be temperate and dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, and in perseverance. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine and teaching. That was where we left off last week. Older women, then, are to be teaching what is good. So here is your call now, older women. The word for good, it means intrinsically Good, that which is intrinsically good and attractive. The Greek word is kalo didaskalos. Kalo didaskalos. And so the elders in Titus were called to be didaskos. They were called to do this authoritative teaching. Teach sound doctrine, elders and men. Women are called then. Now you have a calling to be kalo didaskalos. Teachers of what is good to the younger women. This is where you are to labor. And so this word in the context really carries the idea of life on life. Look with me in verse 4. So in verse 3, you're teaching what is good so that they may encourage the young women. What are we teaching them? To love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. And so this is not so much a call to seminars and classes and formal teaching, which is what Americans tend to do with this. 
we see the list of what we're to teach and we start conferences and pulpits and seminars and, and we start teaching through the books of the Bible and all of these things and we, we finish decades of doing that and we have younger women who are still not getting this, putting the glory of God on display by being these kind of women. They're, they're to work out practical godliness. So in verse 5, it says that the word of God will not be dishonored by our lives. And so this is a call for the older women to engage the younger and teach them, call it a dosco, good things. Be teaching good things. Pour into them. Teach them how to be these kind of women. My wife, I've told you before, she was blessed at seminary. Uh, it changed her life to be discipled and mentored uh, by this older godly woman. And what she learned from her is she has made our home a refuge. It, it's my favorite place to be is home. Have you ever had those long days and you're just driving home, men, and it's like, oh, I love to be home. It's a refuge. She has learned these characteristics from an older woman, and it's beautiful in our house. What this would do to the church of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation the beauty of lives and homes ordered under the lordship of Jesus Christ. I cannot use hyperbole in regards to the importance of this purpose in the church. This is so important to our life and our existence. So fight the world and the church in many places that are preaching this today. We've got women who are being didascos, and they're, they're, they're taking on the role of pastors. And they can never replace God's design for the church. You get into each other's lives is what this is telling us here, ladies. And you teach each other how to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ day to day. In this, the word of God will not be dishonored. Let's pray for Southside. My heart, just asking God this week, is that the older ladies would, would take the mantle and you would see this morning what God's calling you to be and that the younger ladies would embrace this and receive it and come to the older ladies and be learning and that what would happen is that life on life and pouring wisdom of what you've learned into each other will grow you up and the Word of God won't be dishonored. It'll be glorified by these gorgeous homes and lives that will show what happens when Christ is the center of your life. So let's pray and ask God to do that in our midst. Father, we come before you, and I thank you for this section on discipleship. Lord, we're learning how the church works and functions by your design. And God, this is your design, that the older ones, the ones who have walked and learned and grown and uh, have learned wisdom, as we saw in Sunday school this morning. Father, they're wise, and they know how to walk with you. And they've learned through many pitfalls and things they've avoided and things they've fallen into. And God, I pray that they would just not seek retirement, God, that they would seek more than ever to engage in the body of Christ. God, that they would be honored at this church and that we would love their wisdom and who they are and what they represent. And I pray this morning for the young ladies. God, we love them and we want to see them conform to the image of Christ. We live in a culture that is fighting them so hard from being what you've designed them to be. And so I pray by your word this morning that you would reorient them. God, that you would open their eyes to see the need of the older women, that they would see the need to be these kind of women that will be described in our text this morning. And so, God, I know we're fighting against a culture, and that is no problem for the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And so we ask that you would do mighty work in our midst here this morning. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> All right, as we begin to look at these verses this morning, I've, I, I guess I've been around long enough to know that I'm standing against a culture that hates everything that I'm going to say <laughs> this morning. So some of you, this may be finger, fingernails on a chalkboard, and some of you, this might be your last Sunday here. I've enjoyed being your pastor. <laughs> but I just, I can't walk away from Titus 2.1. But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Teach these things. Keep teaching them again and again. Our culture has attacked the role of young women from God's design. This is God's design, not Pastor Murphy's. The feminist attack has been raging for quite some time now, and its effects are thorough and far-reaching. 
So much so that what was the norm of our society, now it is not. What I'm going to teach you now is very controversial, and 40 years ago it wasn't. The feminist movement has indeed changed the world and the church today. There are theologians and professors and pastors who have bought into the feminist lies, and God's being dishonored because of it. It says here, this is how God's word will not be dishonored. The family structure has been left in shambles. Untaught Christians are falling prey to this agenda. And so young people this morning, I want you to let the word of God speak to you this morning. Anything that this world has taught you contrary to the word of God, I'm asking you to let go of it. Release it if it's in the word of God and you've been taught contrary. Let it go. We've been duped. We think that the women's rights movement is some sweet ladies who just want equal pay and equal voice and equal rights. That is not even close to what this is all about. The real feminist agenda and all of its origins and goals is satanic. Gloria Steinman, one of the leaders of it, she said, we want to raise our children to believe in human potential and not God. One of its early leaders said, this marriage, marriage is slavery to women. We must attack this institution and abolish it, and they are doing an amazing job at it. Another leader in it said, when we end the institution of marriage, we have women's rights, which goes back to witchcraft and ancient female religions. Forget about the mythical Jesus. We have had 2,000 years of tyranny under the cross. Mary Jo Bain, a professor, said, to raise children with equality, we must take them away from the family structure and raise them ourselves. They said a male tyrannical God has to go. We have a local seminary in town that's called conservative, and they have classes that when you write papers, you have to, in one class, you have to use inclusive language and call God he, she, or it. This is a call to end Judeo-Christian religion by the feminist movement. And so I start with this. We cannot think lightly about this destructive movement and its agenda in our day. Behind the feminist movement is a very satanic philosophy, and it's destroying our culture, and Christians are falling into its agenda left and right. Feminism is set out to destroy the structure of marriage and family and to empower women, and it's done just that, and the statistics are staggering what it has done to the family. What is God's design, then, to pass on righteousness? In Israel, it was the family. And then you're to walk and speak and talk and teach your kids the way righteousness was passed on in the family structure. War has been waged on the family, and the family is losing badly, and it is slipping in the church. But sound doctrine calls for the roles and the beauty that God established for the family and for the church so that we might adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in every respect. And the way this is going to get done is through sound doctrine and discipleship. That is the way God has designed it. And so as I lay out God's design then for women this morning, one preacher, he said, if you get upset, now you know whose side you're on. So I want you to understand this is a satanic movement, and if you're on that side, that isn't the place you want to be. You want to be on the side of God and his design and his structure. So what good things are you to call to Dasco, the younger ladies, Older women, what is it? Come back now to verse 4. So that. So that is a hint clause, which means a, a purpose or a result. You're teaching these good things for this purpose or this result. Teach them for the purpose that they will be encouraged in these ways. Encourage. Sophronizo means to train, to teach someone self-control. It's been translated in Titus already as sensible with the same root. So it's to make someone very steady or sober-minded. It's really to teach these younger women to be self-disciplined in their duty, in their calling. Raise a generation of godly, sensible women dedicated to doing the will of God. That's the calling. Training is an ongoing relationship. It's confrontation and it's affirmation. It's modeling. It's bringing the word of God to bear. It's discipleship. Remember, a disciple is a follower of Jesus. It is teaching younger women how to follow Jesus Christ as women, older women, your job then is to train these younger women. 
Some of them have moms to do that. Praise God, mothers, teach your children this. But in this generation, some flat out don't have moms to do this. Here are your spiritual moms. Connect. Moms, older women, become those mothers. Get in their lives. Teach them. Model, train them. Connect. We have all kinds of ways to get into discipleship if you want to through uh, different areas here at the church. There's ladies fellowship, midweeks, all of these different ways. Find ways to engage lock shields and be trained by the older women. And embrace being women. It's a beautiful design by God. Love your beautiful role in the family and in the church and in singleness. Learn from the older women how to be godly women. And so my question then is, what does that look like? Who, 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 who uh, am I to train them in? What am I to train them in? And what am I to be trained in should be your question. And so let's look in verse 4. Teaching them, kalo didasko, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands. Isn't that funny that the older ladies have to teach you how to love your husbands? I mean, hasn't Paul seen like Cinderella and all the Disney stories or my favorite Hallmarks? I can tell you how they're going to end before they end every time. But they, they just live happily ever after in this perfect love. And so I, I'm going to meet Mr. Wright and we're going to ride off into the sunset together like a storybook. We're going to have our little house on the prairie with 3.5 kids and a dog in the yard, and everything is going to be so perfect. That doesn't feel like you need ladies to teach you that, doesn't it? Huh? I just, you hear that, and you're like, no, I'm not going to need it. I'll, I'll just love him. He'll be easy. It's going to be beautiful. You know, I don't need help with that. But there's the Greek word, it's one word, husband lovers. Teach them to be husband lovers. This, this cannot just be a feeling then, or you would not have to teach them that. I've never had to teach anyone just to act out their feelings. It's very easy and very natural. So this is not spending all of your days trying to get back that loving feeling. I think he's lost that loving feeling. <laughs> Younger women need to be taught what it is meant then to love your husband. And when the newness wears off and you're two sinners trying to live a life of oneness together, what do you do now? When the butterflies are not fluttering and, and uh, when he comes in from work with muddy shoes and walks over the carpet that you just vacuumed, what's going to happen then? This isn't the fantasy that I've dreamed of all of my days. And I see the young gals when they first get married, I hear this often. It just all of a sudden, it, it isn't what I thought. And I just, I had all these dreams of what it would be like. What do I do now? And this is tough. I'm not getting anything out of this. I'm giving and giving, and most of the time I'm not even appreciated. And then that ugly word, divorce, starts coming in, or I'll just pout until I get my way. And then there's just two people in a house that aren't even connected. That's what begins to happen in marriages. And one preacher said, this is not skyrockets in the flight but a contented commitment with an occasional rocket and a bell and a whistle occasionally. My wife's sick today, but I, I was going to tell her that I get them all the time still, babe. <laughs> love, agape, is the love of the will. And that is something, it's not so much a feeling, it's a, it's a commitment. And the whole Bible is we love because he first loved us. And so agape is I set my will to love. I am, I'm, whether I feel like it or not, I am devoted to love and to give my life away for you. And so that is a very, very deep, settled commitment. It's a team that wants to glorify God and forget ourselves. Love has to die to self-love. Every problem in your marriage this morning is because you love yourself. Philippians 1 says we are to grow in a discerning love. So as believers, we keep learning the Word of God and wisdom, and we are learning how to love one another. And so older women teach the younger women how to love their husbands. Get in and start teaching them this wisdom. How does it work? How does it function when he does this? How do I respond then? We are, to, older women, teach them how to love their husbands. This is your calling. This is so crucial to the beauty of the church. Younger women learning how to love their husbands. This is no small task. You need help. 
Go for it. Get it. Look to the older ladies and learn from them. There's some ladies in this church who have had to love some really difficult men, including my own wife. And so they've learned how to love difficult men and what it's like and how they do it. I'm amazed at some of the ladies I've watched. I'm just like, I couldn't deal with that guy for a week. And they're just, yes, honey, and they're just serving them and loving them. There's just so much that can be learned in this. Look to the older ladies. They have, they've had to learn for decades, raising kids together and all that goes with it in a marriage, and they have learned how to love their husbands. So older women teach the younger women how to love their husbands. Secondly, in verse 4, teach them how to love their children. Again, it's one word in the Greek, just children lovers. Teach them to be children lovers. And this is the one thing that women do not need, right? I mean, have you ever met a woman that needs help how to love their child? When, when that little guy or girl is born and it's placed in your arms, what happens? Is it just instantly a mama is bursting with love. It's unbelievable. It's amazing. I love this child. I will give my life for this child. But what else happens at that moment? Everyone should name their first child Buddha. Because no matter what the birth certificate says, it's your new idol. And so it comes out and it's like, I love this child, but suddenly here's my new idol. I'm going to find my joy and my purpose and all of my contentment in this little child. My identity will be found in this young lad. And you start to overprotect And you start to not let them grow up and you control them instead of releasing them. And your joy is bound to their joy and your sorrow is bound to their sorrow. So why would Paul instruct older women to teach the younger women how to love their children? It just seems like moms don't have any problem with that. They need help for how to love them rightly. You need help to love them rightly. How do I love this little child to Jesus Christ? That's the passion of every believing husband and and wife when you have that. I just want to know Jesus Christ. How do I do that rightly? Paul said to Timothy, from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. Paul, you've been taught since you were a child by your mother and your grandmother, and, and all you were taught was the Old Testament scriptures. And as you were taught those Old Testament scriptures, they gave you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. They saw Christ as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. They preached Jesus Christ from the Old Testament. So you need to be theologians, moms. You need to learn and understand the whole flow of the Bible and how the Old Testament is a portrait of Jesus and how it pictures and points and leads. So how do I, as a parent, train and teach my children the gospel? How do I discipline them in a culture that says that's child abuse? How do I train them and nurture them in godliness? How do I not tie my joy to theirs? How do I not live through their accomplishments? How do I, how do I live a godly life? Young moms, you need the older ladies to teach you. And so don't be arrogant. You get one chance at this. Get help. Go ask them. Get them over. Let them be around your family and ask them. Be humbled. Share with me, what are you seeing in my parenting? What do you see with my kids? Kalodidasko me. Teach me good things and how to love my child. The world tells you you need to, to break out of this role of a mother and go get a career to have true satisfaction. Moms are fleeing the place that God has designed for them. And for the beauty of the kingdom of God, this is God's design of how he passes the torch. Love your children. Lay down your lives for them. Teach them of Jesus by word and by deed and pray for them and correct them and train them and fight the lie that your life has no meaning or purpose. I want you to hear that, Mom, right now. You have the greatest purpose and pointing these little ones again and again to Jesus Christ. And it gets hard and it gets wearisome and I just don't lose heart in doing good. And you need the older women to come alongside and teach you and encourage and pray and help. If single or barren, don't ever miss your high calling and beautiful place in serving and advancing the kingdom of God. As in this day and age, majority, they had to be married or they couldn't even function 
and that society. And so Paul's addressing a lot of that. But in our day and age, there's a lot more of singleness. And so the church needs all of this. One of our single ladies that's a friend of mine has done more in discipling the next generation of girls than anyone in this church. And so I pray that you guys will, will learn this well. Verse 4. Thirdly, then, teach them to be sensible. Common sense things of life. This word means self-controlled. Teach them how to have self-control. I'm sure it has something to do with shopping. Uh, teach them uh, cleanliness and orderliness of life, the things that they read, the things that they watch, romance novels that will destroy every marriage. John MacArthur said something interesting. He said, he and his wife, Patri Patricia, have never been to a marriage seminar or child-rearing seminar their whole lives. They said they both were blessed to be raised in families where it was modeled, and they were sensible. They, they learned by just modeling and watching and being in godly homes how to raise godly children. And so here's how it's passed down. Teach them how to be self-controlled in their eating, in their emotions, in training my kids. Just don't, don't let your girls cry over everything. You know, teach them how to have self-control in their emotions, how to have self-control in your talking when your husband comes home from work, how to have self-control over the television, self-control over Facebook or self-control over your phone. I'm hearing more and more children say my, my parents are always in their phone. So we, we, we say it's the teenager thing. Well, it's starting to become an adult thing. And, and so teach them how to be sensible and how to have self-control and, and, and engaging in the things we've already learned, how to love their husbands and love their children. Fourthly, very important in our generation, teach them how to be pure. It means chaste, sexually faithful, devoted to one man, morally pure. Teach them how to be pure in a society that is so impure. Teach them on the inside, as Peter said, don't let it just be the external braiding of hair, be your beauty. Let it be the inner quality of the heart. Teach them how to guard their minds and their hearts in purity. Teach them modesty. Teach them not wanting the attention of men, but just one, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so teach your children, teach these younger women how to be pure in an impure world. I'm shocked at the statistics of how many women are starting to look at pornography now in our day and age. It's no longer a male sin anymore. Teach these younger women how to be pure older women, get in their lives and train them. They're facing new temptations that your generation has never seen. They need the older women more than ever how to be pure even as women. And fifthly, teach them how to be workers at home. So I might as well finish off my lynching in one sermon. <clears throat> I've read book after book, sermon after sermon that tells us why this doesn't mean what it says. It doesn't really mean that. I think Paul knew exactly what he was saying. You're to teach them to be workers at home. This is your sphere and your realm, godly women. The home, the home, make it a refuge, a place from this world where they can come and there's safety and there's the word of God consecrated. It's, it's kind, it's beautiful. Make home a refuge. Again, my wife made it the best place in the world to come to. My kids love to come home. It's safe, and it's warm, and it's loving. Well over 60% of mothers with kids under six now have to work. I, not even have to. Some have to. Some do full time. And so I do. I want you to get this. In Proverbs 31, that picture of that godly woman, she did work. She would go outside the home and do the things that she could help uh, with finances and different things in that house, but it, to help with money. There's nothing wrong with that. There can be injuries to the man of the house, unemployment, financial crisis, so you have to eat. I get all of those things. There are, I'm not here saying there aren't reasons, but I'm just telling you what God's design is. God's design is that the woman's realm, her sphere, is the home. Teach them to be workers there laying down their lives for the home. This word carries the idea of working to the point of fatigue. Too many are at home and they're not working. Teach them how to work in the sphere of their house. 
Yes, it's tiring being a mom. It is hard working at home. I think it's one of the toughest jobs there is. Yet it is God's calling. It is God's realm. It is God's place to labor for the good of the kingdom of God. The home is the sphere of your life. You're always working to make this possible. Great sacrifices can be made to shoot for this. My mom never bought a new stitch of clothing for 15 years so she could be home with her seven boys and clip coupons in and as a family we ate out twice a year. All my clothes were hand-me-downs and when you got five older brothers, I didn't know what it meant to have clothes without holes. I shared a room with several brothers and it's the best memories of my life. But I had that dear lady, that dear lady every day before I left for school. And every day I came home, there she was. And if I was ever sick, it was the best experience of my life. I liked getting sick. I, I would get sick with strep, and she would make me chicken and stars, Campbell's. And then when I started feeling better, she moved to chicken and dumplings. And as I was healing, bean with bacon, and then real food. Every time. I love my mom. Sacrifice as much as you can to keep moms at home if it's possible. There are times when it's not possible, I understand. But we should help each other the best we can to make it possible. I want us to be teamwork and sacrifice so our younger women can be workers at home and do everything we can as a church to help this take place. So older women, teach them how to bust chops for the kingdom of God by their homes being a refuge and a place to be a launching, pla launching pad for the name and glory of Jesus Christ. Amen? Home is your main priority. Work outside to help the family. But home is where your heart is. Don't leave it and shirk it off because it's too stressful or too much. From your home, ladies, is the opportunity to have the greatest impact on the world. Right from your homes is the greatest opportunity. And the feminists call it an illegitimate profession. And God calls it his means that the word of God would not be dishonored. If Christians abandon the home, the family will fall apart. Home is where we teach our children. Home is where they're protected and secured. Home houses strangers and washes the feet of the saints and homes where we minister to one another whether you can go outside of it and work and not sacrifice this as between a husband and wife and we give you that freedom and beauty to work that out in every marriage but I just want you to understand what God's word says older women teach these younger women to be workers at home it means what it says teach them to be kind that word, mean, that word means gentle tender hearted and merciful you have all the pressures of home, moms, it's unbelievable, and there's still kindness. The fruit of the Spirit is I want a home that is characterized by kindness. The one place that the kids receive kindness is mom. Moms, everyone is always pulling at you. I know it's so tough. My wife, she, she could not go to the bathroom when the kids were younger. It just the whole time someone was knocking on that door, where's this, where's that, I need you, mom. I, all I want is five minutes. And so... To stay kind is so tough because it's constant and nonstop. And so older women, come teach them how to be kind. Maybe even help them so that it's easier for them to be kind. This is the beauty of the church of God. I've done enough funerals to know this. You're not going to be remembered for your university degree. You're not going to be remembered for your great jobs. But what I've seen at every funeral is story after story of your kindness. It's not forgotten, it is so impactful. And those children, when they gather around, they're gonna share the stories about how kind their mama was. Number seven, I might as well just finish it off. Being subject to their own husbands. Uh, any surprise that all of these things are being under attack? Be subject to your own husbands. Voluntary, Bringing yourself under your husband's loving headship, and sometimes it's just headship, to bring yourself under it, to bring yourself under Christ in submission to your husband. 
one of the most hated teachings in the world today. You get it from every angle not to do this. And the curse in Genesis is that the woman is going to desire her husband, yet he will rule over you. And so there's a very curse. That word for desire means to, des- to control. And so you're going to have a desire to control your husband. It's part of the curse. There, even as a believing woman, there's a hangover that still is there in that battle. So there, there's a battle to be submissive to your husband. And so you need the older women to teach you how to do this. And again, I told you this. My, my wife was a Nazi feminist. She learned it at a Christian college. And we went off to seminary, and, and John MacArthur's secretary, her name was Pat Ratisky, took her under her wing and just lovingly broke it and taught her the word and modeled it and brought it. And I've been eating that fruit ever since. I just want to buy that lady lunch every time I see her. <laughs> Everyone should send their wife to someone like that. You'll love the fruit of it. So I can't, I just can't tell you enough how much older women are needed to help teach the younger women this beautiful design that God has made for the home. Teach them this, older women. Husbands are bad at teaching this. Would every woman agree? And honestly, they're not called to. They're, they're called to love their wives. And they're not called to teach you how to be submissive. But the older women are called to teach you how to be submissive to your husband. And so what a mess this makes of the church of God when the women try to run their homes and try to be the head of their homes and in the church. So why do all of this? Why is this so important this morning to your pastor? Well, look with me in verse 5. So that the word of God will not be dishonored. And that word, again, is the word for blasphemed. We, we don't want naming the name of Jesus Christ, lifting him up, proclaiming, declaring him to be a saving God. And then people come into the church or they watch our lives in our neighborhoods and they see these uh, ladies who don't care about their homes, their families are falling apart, they're fighting as, as much as they are as unbelievers, and everything is broken. And what, what happens is the word of God is blasphemed. They're no different than we are. But when this is all ordered the way God has designed it, there's an evangelism and a beauty to this that is second to none. One man said the greatest apologetic for Christianity is to display humbly the difference that Jesus makes in our hearts and in our homes. People will then say, what is the hope within you when these things are ordered this way? This matters. The name of God is at stake. His glory and his kingdom And so I pray that the women are taking this to heart. Men, you'll get it next week. So women, you play such a mighty and crucial role in the putting on display the glory of God through our homes and the fruit thereof. Quit fighting for the role of elder. Get in with the younger women. Open up your Bibles and your lives and your experience and teach one another these beautiful qualities of a godly woman so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Amen? Maybe just in closing, some application questions. And the the first one is pretty easy. Are you doing this in any way? I just, you you can nod your head and say, that's good, I like that, I agree. That's that's what the word says. But just, are you doing this in any way? Are are you, any older, younger women, are are you in any way making these connections and pouring in and, building up? Are you doing it? Are you learning a lot in Sunday school and midweek? A lot of teaching. What, what are you going to do with it? What are you doing with it? Is it just for you? Has your Christianity just become me and God? Or is it for this whole body is what we're seeing here in Titus? James 1.22, do not uh, be merely hearers of the word of God, but be doers of the word of God. And so what you hear this morning, it's not enough just to hear it. Are you going to be a doer of the word of God? The the very name of God is at stake that we do this in this church for his name and his name's sake. What excuse did you make during my sermon as to why you're not doing this if you're young or old? Did you make some excuses during it as to why you're not doing it? Did 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 you let the word of God search you or did you just throw it out and say, nah, this is what I do? Are you willing 
to risk and sacrifice to make these kind of relationships. You've got to go out on a limb and you've got to stretch yourself. You've got to ask. You've got to get in each other's lives. It's going to take work and effort. You know where I have almost 0% counseling now? Is people in community groups. It's, it's almost disappeared. Why do you think that would happen? Because you're doing it for each other. You're, you're building in, you're, you're helping each other, you're counseling, you're building the relationships, and all these things I'm talking about are happening in these community groups. Do we have any other options is what I would ask you this morning. I, I don't believe we have any other options. This is the Word of God. And so I want the ladies to dream and come up with things of how do we do this? How can, how can we do it better? What can we organize? I, I'd like to do this at my house. Just let's, let's go for it. Just let the Spirit lead and find ways. And, you know, because it, it says the older women. And so I don't know how to do this. I stink at helping ladies be good younger ladies. Okay? Get the, we, you need each other. And so I just want you to, the older women, to figure it out and come up with ideas and join hands. And how do we do this? How can we get this going? Uh, and grow deeper in it. It's happening in a lot, a lot of different ways, but I want it to excel still more. So the elders can't do this. The teachers of the church cannot do this. The older women, this belongs to you alone. This is your high calling from God. Join forces and seek God and give yourselves to this task. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have designed the church perfect. Lord, it's no surprise to us. You have perfect wisdom. You've designed this before the foundation of the world. And I just thank you, Lord, for the women of this church. I thank you. I know many churches where they're crying out for godly older women, and we have them in abundance. And so, God, I pray that they would uh, feel their, their high calling and responsibility in the church, that they wouldn't buy the lie that they're not worth anything when they're older, for they have never been of more value than they are right now in the body of Christ. God, encourage their hearts. Let them step out in faith and not, um, not believe the lies of the world, what they're telling them. And so, Lord, I, I pray that you will raise up these older women and you'll lead them and guide them to come up with ways to, to help facilitate this. Lord, the only way it'll happen is organically by your spirit. But we, we know there's also that we need to prepare the trellis so the vine can grow and so give us wisdom and how to do that. Let the older women find that and design it. And we just look to them being led by you. And I pray for our younger women. God, they're so tired and weary and trying to run a home and love a husband who's difficult. God, I pray that you would help them. I pray that they would open up to older women and not just to women their age who are going through the same thing, but for the ones who have already navigated it and have learned wisdom. God, help them to, to, to be courageous, to go up to an older lady and just say, I just want to learn. Would you have me over for coffee? And just help both sides, like there's a cold war, to just open up. We, we have the lies of a, a generation that are told that uh, they don't need older people. God, break that down in their minds and their hearts. Help them to see it, desire it, and want it. God, I just pray that you will do mighty things in our midst uh, in, with our women. And God, I pray next week the same for our men. We are just asking that with, with sound doctrine that we will now engage each other's lives and help each other live godly lives that will be pleasing to you. Thank you for the structure and the way you've designed this, God. We praise you and we look to you. We can do nothing in our own strength. God, by your spirit, do this in our midst, we pray. Amen.